very warm welcome to you all and a special welcome to everyone at the service, either online or in the church, at the first sacrament of Holy Communion that we've celebrated together in the church in 18 months. Last Sunday, as I said last Sunday, on this occasion with the restrictions, we cannot press pass the bread and wine along the pew, and everyone's been given a container as they entered the church this morning with a wafer at the top and your juice, what grape juice below. I'll explain more about that as we come to the communion service. I'm sure some of you may have realized there's no organist here this morning. Dot was in hospital overnight last week, and now she's with her dad, as sadly Betty McPherson took a bad stroke on Thursday evening. She's in Crosshouse Hospital, and Dot told me in an email that she was improving slightly yesterday. So we're remembering Betty, Dot and all the family in our prayers later in the service. We'll also be remembering Elizabeth Dow, who sadly lost her brother last week. And I know many of you are praying for Irene Gibson, who had an operation in hospital in Glasgow. She's now home and we'll be praying for her too. The ladies are still looking for shoe boxes and the sh <coughs> to bring to the front of the church and the list of items to go inside the pew boxes, inside the shoe boxes is listed in the children in distress leaflet. If you're now unable to go to the shops, then I know that a small donation of money would be very well accepted. And there'll be a prayer meeting for the North Air grouping held in the session room here at Newton Wallace Town Church Hall on Monday the 13th of September at 7 p.m. The chairs will be placed one meter apart according to the present regulations. A call to worship this morning is from Psalm 106, verse 1. Praise the Lord, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his love endures forever. So let us worship God, singing together with the praise band, the hymn, There is Power in the Name of Jesus.
There's no Sunday school this morning, but I thought that since we've been unable to have a communion service together in the church since March 2020, it'd be good to have a short reminder about the meaning of the five C's of communion this morning. The first C is community. In the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 20, Paul says that we are to come together to celebrate the Lord's Supper. We are to meet in fellowship with other Christians. One of the problems of this pandemic has been that for so long we were unable to meet together for worship here in the church. We are now here, although we still have to sit a meter apart, wear masks, and, as I said, are unable to have the bread and wine passed along the pews. However, this is the best we can do for our circumstances today. So as we gather together for communion, we're reminded not only of our oneness in Christ, but also that we're a community of the cross. We enjoy and experience a relationship with God vertically, and we enjoy and really a relationship with one another vertically. So we meet in the cross. And the second C is commemoration. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. He, <clears throat> we're commanded to do this. We're not just invited to do it. It's not, I suggest you do this or try to do this. It is clearly a command. And the word do in Greek suggests repetition. This is something that has to be done time and time again. We think we would never forget the words, do this in remembrance of me, but if we're honest, we know that we do forget. Jesus knew that when we saw the bread and the wine, then we would remember Calvary. Jesus knows how easily we forget, and so he commanded that in the life of the church, there would be regular times when we would take the bread and the wine, and Jesus himself would be powerfully known to us in the breaking of the bread. The third C is covenant. In all four Gospels, passages about the Last Supper use the word covenant. For example, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. It was through the shedding of Jesus' blood that God took the initiative in establishing a new covenant. God had always been willing to forgive sin, but none of the Old Testament sacrifices could ever really take away sin. A new way had to be found, and when Jesus shared the Last Supper with his disciples, he inaugurated this new way. When I hold up the cup, I shall say, this is the cup of the new covenant sealed by Christ's blood, which was shed that the sins of many might be forgiven. In the past, I was minister of a church where someone did not attend the communion service because she didn't like the word blood being used. But the blood of Christ is one of the most sacred and significant phrases in the whole of Scripture. As we so sing, his vow, his covenant and blood and my defense against the flood. When earthly hopes are swept away, he will hold me on the day. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. The fourth C is the word celebration. I'm sure you're familiar with the word Eucharist that is used in the Anglican Church when they celebrate communion. The word Eucharist itself means thanksgiving. And as Jesus celebrated the Last Supper with his disciples, he gave thanks. And although we are commemorating Jesus' death on the cross for all our sins, we are not to forget that he rose again and there could be nothing more joyful than Jesus' resurrection. The communion service should therefore also be a time of rejoicing and celebration. And the fifth C is the word commitment. When we take part in a communion service, we come with a willingness to examine our lifestyle, our motives and our habits, and to be willing, we have to be willing to break with the things that dishonor the Lord. In chapter 11, verse 28, 
of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, he says, a person ought to examine themselves before he eats the bread and drinks the cup. This means we are to confess our sins to Jesus, receive his forgiveness, and then move closer to him. So that's a communion service. We share in community together as we share in the bread and the wine. We believe that Jesus died on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. And we commit ourselves to serving Jesus in the world today. Amen. Let us now sing the hymn that I quoted just now, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. Dorothy recorded three hymns before she went into hospital, so they'll be shown on the screen. The words will be shown and we'll hear the music. My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. our God in prayer, let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed, through our own fault and in common with others. We are truly sorry and humbly turn from our sins. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. 
Lord, have mercy upon us. Almighty God, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal. This we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us hear the word of God. John here will read the passage for us this morning. The reading this morning is taken from the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, reading from verses 10 to 18. It is headed, The Armor of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled round your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with the, your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Amen. And would God add his blessing to this reading from his Holy Word. Thank you, John. We sing together now the hymn, Love Songs from Heaven Are Filling the Earth.
title for the sermon this morning is Communion. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The Reverend J.M. Garfield says he was teaching in a boys' comprehensive school. One morning, the first formers received quite a shock. The day started normally with registration and then filing into the hall for the assembly. Once they were seated, the great surprise came. Instead of a member of staff stepping forward to read a morally uplifting story, they heard some martial music being blasted out. And then, with a loud clatter, in walked a Roman soldier. Waving his sword and shouting above the loud music, he told these 11-year-olds that they were the rebellious Britons, and unless they changed their ways, the whole might of the imperial army would be turned upon them, and their whole country would be reduced to a desolate wilderness. But now the boys were starting to recover from the shock, and the music was turned down, and everyone wanted to know what it was all about. It turned out that the soldier, in inverted commas, was publicising a charity walk that was going to take place in a few weeks' time. He had borrowed the soldier's army from a soldier's uniform from a museum. And the boys wanted a closer look at the, his equipment, at his uniform. The clothing of another age always fascinates us, both children and adults alike. We imagine ourselves living in these days wearing that uniform. What would we have felt? What things would have mattered to us? The soldier was now answering these questions and others. Jim Garfield goes on. It was in answering one of these questions that the romantic dreams were brought down to earth. How did the Romans fight? asked one of the boys. The soldier looked straight at him and pulled out his short sword. Stabbing the enemy was not enough, they were told. That might wound, a person, wound him, but not necessarily stop him. The soldier said, what you had to do was thrust the, the blade into the stomach of your enemy and then quickly turn your wrist. And it was the second movement that finished him off. All at once, he said, we became aware that the Roman times were not just romantic, they were dangerous and brutal as well. This military costume wasn't simply a relic of a bygone age. It was the uniform of men who had a hard job to do. It was designed for use in battle by men who would stand and fight. In the passage that we've just heard from Ephesians chapter 6, entitled The Armour of God, Paul says we are to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. The word strong emphasizes something that we can do by ourselves, but in his mighty power emphasizes what the Lord can do, and it points to the heart of faith. God will empower us for what he's calling us to do. We heard at verse 11, put on the full armor of God. But why, we might ask, is it because it looks good and gives us an understanding of the past? Obviously, the answer to that is no. Armour is for those who will stand and fight. Obviously, we're not called ever to kill others, but we're to stand up and fight for what we believe in. However, at times, we might seem more like people who seem as if they want to run away. It's times when we sing, O God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. There's nothing wrong with these words, but they could give the impression that Christianity is hiding from danger rather than standing and fighting. But these words are meant for those who are finding things too hard to bear, those whose courage has failed those who need security from their problems and difficulties. Christianity does offer help 
and comfort to those who are bruised or broken by life. And Jesus himself said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. In Jesus' name, the church welcomes, shelters, and ministers to those who are trying to cope with the demands that life can throw at them. The strength of God that we are promised means that God will strengthen us for all the times in our life when we find situations so difficult to deal with. Jesus on the night of his arrest, after his final meal with his disciples and with the agony of Gethsemane ahead of him, on that night Jesus prayed for his disciples. He said, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. Does protect mean that God will provide a shield and a hiding place for us? But I do not believe that's what Jesus means. He goes on to say in John chapter 17 at verse 15, My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but protect them from the evil one. Here Jesus is not speaking to his disciples about physical danger. He believes his disciples can cope with the physical challenges. Nor is he telling them to cut themselves off from the world to seek shelter from the stormy blast or hide behind locked doors. Instead, Jesus is sending his disciples into the world with the warning that suffering and persecution can be expected because they follow him. Christianity does not mean that we withdraw from life, but it strengthens and equips us for all that can happen in our life. It doesn't mean a life in which we'll escape from our troubles but we can face our troubles and conquer them. It's as if Jesus is saying, go out into the world, taking the love of God with you, whatever the physical discomforts might be. However, our greatest danger is not physical, but spiritual. Jesus says, protect them from the evil one. The Bible does not discuss the origins of evil, but it's quite certain that in the world there is the power of evil which is against the power of God. As I said earlier in Paul's letter to the Ephesians at verse 13, he tells us to put on the armour of God so we will be able to stand up to the devil's schemes or evil tricks. The words are, as I said, put on the full armour of God. If any piece of the armour is missing, then the soldier becomes quite vulnerable. The enemy will target the place where the soldier has failed to protect himself. And in the same way, the devil attacks, attacks us at our weakest point. We have to put the belt of truth buckled around our waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with our feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition, we are to take up the shield of faith, (coughs) the helm of salvation, and the sword, which is the word of God. That's a lot to take in, but I think, well, I'd like to think about them one by one. The belt of truth is to be buckled around our waist. The Roman soldier wore a loose tunic that could get in the way of fighting, and so they wore a belt to keep the robe tight against their body. They were to be honest and tell the truth. And being truthful is so important to our Christian witness too. The breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate protected the vital organs of the soldier and was designed to stop arrows, spears and blows from the sword. The Jews thought that they were righteous if they obeyed the law. But Christians know that we are righteous, that is, right before God, because of the grace given by Jesus, not because of anything that we can do. Your feet are to be fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Soldiers know the value of a good pair of boots, and they're ready, and then they are prepared. And when they're ready and prepared, then they know the peace of God that comes 
from a deep relationship with God. And we too <coughs> know that <coughs> we know too know that inner peace in our hearts when we have a deep relationship with God. And that to take up the shield of faith, to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And we need protection against the negative thoughts that sometimes come into our minds. We have to really raise the shield of faith to remind the devil that we belong to the one whose power enables us to withstand temptation. The helmet of salvation is to protect the soldier's head. A blow to the head is most likely to disable a soldier than any blow to his body. Satan can make us doubt our faith or have other questions in our minds, but the helmet of salvation assures us that we have been saved. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. When we feel that we are being attacked by the devil, then we are to quote a passage from the Bible. When Jesus did this, then the devil or the tempter left him, and he will leave us too. The message is clear. If we have faith, then we have nothing to fear in the world. Our armour is for fighting in. We are the church, and if we are to be true to its Lord, the church is to follow our Lord and go out into the world. Just now we're still in the midst of this pandemic, but we know that the new presbytery plan is a mission plan. Whether plan A or plan B or another plan is agreed, this church will be involved in mission in the future. And this morning as we share in taking the wafer, representing Jesus' body, and the grape juice, representing Jesus' blood, and as we put on the gospel armour of faith, we are ready to grow in our Christian faith and when the time comes, to go out in mission. Amen. A communion hymn this morning is Lord Jesus Christ.
corporate part of the service, I'm going to ask you to take your small container and you'll see there's a point at the side. If you take, don't do it just now, please, but if you pull that back, then you can get the wafer out and then afterwards there's another part to pull and then you can get to the grape juice. But I'll explain it as we go on. Could I also say that at the end of the service, could you please take this empty container with you and there's a bin at the door so that the container is only touched by yourself as you come in and go out and nobody else has to gather them up and touch them all after. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. As the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he's betrayed, took bread. I take these elements of bread and wine, and those represented in all the containers, to be set apart from their common use to this holy use and mystery. And as Jesus thanks and blessed, let us draw near to God and offer him our prayers of thanksgiving. Let us pray. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, at all times and in all places, to give you thanks and praise, almighty and eternal God. For the wonder of your majesty, for the <coughs> riches of your grace, we give you thanks and praise. And with your people of all times and places, and with the whole company of heaven, we proclaim your greatness and sing the praise of the angel's song. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We bless you for Jesus' holy birth, his perfect life on earth, his suffering for us and his triumph over death for his ascension to your right hand, his gift of the Holy Spirit, and for the promise of his coming again. Send down your Holy Spirit, we pray, to bless us, and the bread which we break may be for us the communion of the body of Christ, and the cup of blessing which we bless, the communion of the blood of Christ, that we receiving then, by faith, may be partakers of his body and blood with all its benefits to nourish us and help us grow in grace to the glory of your most holy name. And here we offer and present to you our very selves to be a living sacrifice dedicated and fit for your acceptance. This we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. According to the holy institution, example and command of our Lord Jesus Christ and as memorial of him we do this. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of him. In the same way, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is a new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. Could I ask you now please to take your container and to take off the top part to get the wafer outside. To get the wafer out. Take, eat, this is the body of Christ which is broken for you. Eat this, do this, in remembrance of him. And if you would now remove the spoil top of the grape juice. This cup is a new covenant sealed by Christ's blood, which was shed that the sins of many might be forgiven. Drink from it in remembrance of him.
peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And let us again pray. Gracious God, we praise you for your goodness to us. You fed us with the bread of life. You've made us one with your people in heaven and on earth and assured us of your everlasting love. We pray for the Church of Jesus Christ, especially our own congregation and parish, that we may be united as we face an uncertain future at this present time. Loving God, we pray this morning for Betty McPherson in Cross House Hospital, and we ask your blessing to our husband Danny, on Dot, Alistair, and the other members of the family. Bless Elizabeth Dow as she mourns the death of our brother Ian. Lord God, we pray for Irene Gibson as she recovers at home after her operation last week. And bless the others we know who've lost a loved one, those who've been bereaved, and those who were not well at the present time. In a few moments of silence, let us bring before our Heavenly Father those uppermost in our thoughts this morning. Bless each one, Lord, and we pray for our families and friends that they may be sure that there is nothing in death or life, nothing in the world as it is or as it shall be, there is nothing in all creation that can separate us them from your love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is Be Thou My Vision with the New Scottish Hymns Band.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. Amen. Could you please remember to take your container and the pieces of paper out with you and put it in the bin in the vestibule? Thank you. <laughs>